So hey everybody, welcome to Embrace. We're glad you're able to join us today for worship. My name is Stephen Bromblow. I'm one of the pastors here at Embrace. And once again, I want to say we're glad that you're here. I want to take a second just to say thank you. Thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for uh, giving. Uh, we, we appreciate the gifts that you give. Uh, if you watch these videos online and you're able to give, we sure do appreciate it. There's ways in which you can give. If you go to our website, embracecanton.church, there's a way you can give there, or uh, you can text to give, or you can just reach out to us and find any other way that you really want to give. And we just want to say thank you, and we appreciate it. So we're in a sermon series that we've entitled The Story of the Spirit. We're looking at how the Spirit has uh, worked in the life of people, has really set the church into mission. Of course, we, we're using the book of Acts as our guide, and we're kind of uh, just kind of marching right through Acts. And so, so far, so far, we've covered the first five books of, uh, of Acts, first five chapters of Acts. And, and there's a common theme that runs through this book so far, and it's this. It's being filled with the Holy Spirit or being baptized by the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, verse 5, you hear the command that Jesus gives to the disciples. He says, Hey, don't leave Jerusalem, but, but stay here until you are baptized with the Holy Spirit or filled with the Holy Spirit. And then all of a sudden we see there's that Pentecost moment, right? When the Holy Spirit rushes into the upper room and tongues like fire rest on each person. And each person is filled with the Holy Spirit. And then that instance, the Spirit inside people, it spills out into the streets and really a revival takes place, if you will. It's, it's, it's people are giving their hearts and lives to Christ. Lives, lives are being changed. The New Testament church, there, it, it kind of kicks forward and it spreads out and it, it just goes into motion and it begins to grow. Now, if you are a part of any movement, a part of any kind of institution that's had any growth, you would know uh, that there are growing pains as you grow. Even here at Embrace, we've experienced uh, even our own uh, growing pains, if you will. And so uh, sometimes uh, the growing pains cause things to be neglected. Well, that was what was happening in the New Testament church. For whatever reason, whatever reason, as this church began to grow, there were a group of people, the widows, who were being uh, neglected. They were not being taken care of. And so they began kind of a, uh, a conversation among them and they began to kind of grumble a little bit about how the widows were being uh, neglected. And so the apostles knew they had to do something about this. Well, they knew they needed to keep teaching and praying and, and preaching. And so they said, we, we've got to come up with another solution. So they gathered up and they selected seven people, which scripture says seven men who were filled with the Holy Spirit to kind of take on the role of serving. Let me, let me give you the names of, of these seven people. Uh, they were uh, Stephen, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolaus. Now there's something interesting about every one of these men who are chosen. Not a one of them has a Jewish name, which really tells you something about the growth of the church, which tells you really something about the church and how it's going to spread. It's not going to be just be for the Jews. It was going to be for everyone. In fact, the scripture says here, this Nicolaus, that he was actually a Gentile who was converted to Judaism. And so it wasn't about the Jewish men. It was about uh, other people. In other words, Christianity just was, wasn't just for the Jews. It was for the entire the world. But see, the Jews saw themselves as the chosen. And in some aspects, they were. I mean, they were chosen to be God's people from the beginning. But but their chosenness wasn't intended for them to keep God just to themselves. God was to be spread. And in fact, they were probably to be the agents. They were to be the agents who would, who would spread God's word all over. But they didn't believe that. In fact, they believed that, uh, they believed that uh, anyone besides themselves, if, like the Gentiles, they believed that Gentiles are really no more than just kind of firewood for hell, if you would. That they believed that the Gentiles were... Uh, maybe just a dumpster fire over to the side. And at the most, the Gentiles would just become uh, their servants. And that's kind of what you get uh, all the way up to chapter, uh, through chapters one through five. But, but then we come to chapter six. And there was this man named Stephen, who was one of the chosen seven, which the Bible says these three things about him. 
that he was filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, chapter 6, verse 5, and that he was full of grace and power, chapter 6, verse 8. And see, Stephen had a different vision, if you would. Uh, Stephen had a vision of the whole world living in Christ. And so with this vision in mind, Stephen performed miraculous signs and wonders uh, that changed people's lives. Well, well, there was this group of men who, who obviously didn't like the ways, didn't like the way of the Christian church. And they rose up against Stephen and they made false allegations against him. And they said things like, like he, uh, he speaks against the temple. And he speaks against the law, uh, laws of Moses, which now for the Jews, the temple was the place in which the presence of God was there in the temple. And the law of Moses, well, it was the law of Moses. It's, it's the way in which uh, the Jews decided to live. And so they brought up false allegations against Stephen. And, and so they arrested Stephen and they brought him before the high Jewish council. And that's, that's where we get, uh, that's when we move into chapter 7. And when asked, when Stephen was asked in front of the high council if these allegations are true, he then went to this uh, overview history of the, of the Jewish uh, uh, nation. And since he was specifically uh, uh, alleged to be talking against the temple and the laws of Moses, he spoke into those matters concerning the temple. He talked about how uh, under Moses, how the tabernacle was, was, was carried from place to place that the Israelites went, and the presence of God there was, was there with them. And he talked about how then Joshua, who, was, uh, who succeeded uh, Moses, how in moving into the ter new territory, Josh took the tabernacle into the new territory. And he spoke of David and how David had this desire when he was king to build, to build a permanent structure, a temple, but because there was so much blood on his hands, he couldn't perform that task. So it was his son Solomon who then uh, completed the temple. Now, up to this point, in, in Stephen's defense against the allegations, you would have uh, you would have seen the high council probably nod on the heads, like, yeah, but, uh, yeah, we agree with you. But then we get to this sentence. Uh, we we come to Acts chapter seven, verse forty-eight, and 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 the sentence in which Stephen says it begins with this word, uh, however. Now, in Scripture, when you see the word however, that's a contrasting word. In other words, when you see that, you you would say whatever was said before. Uh, and what it was said afterwards, the things before, we're about to contrast either uh, the thoughts or the normal way of thinking that's been taught before. We're about to contrast it. And, that, and Stephen uses where he starts off by saying, however. And I love what he says. He has a contrasting thought to the, to the cultural norms of Jews. And here's what he says. Acts 7, 48. However, the Most High doesn't live in temples made by human hands pretty simple sentence but that went against cultural norms see the Jews believed the temple was the most sacred place the temple was the place in which God himself re resided but see Jesus uh, but Stephen see he, ha he had a vision for the world living in Christ and only through a spirit of courage could Stephen begin to speak to the heart of what Jesus thought only could he speak aloud the life that, that Jesus lived. Only through spirit courage could he speak against what the Jews thought was just God's presence there in the temple. Now sometimes, I get it, sometimes it's hard to speak against cultural norms that are wrong. Think about it. America, and, and honestly the American church, have accepted and implemented so many cultural norms into our, into our way of living and our way of life that, that really aren't biblically based. But we shouldn't be surprised because cultural norms, cultural norms are really uh, worldly thoughts and worldly living, and they're really not godly living. It's like we can say and, and maybe say that America is uh, a godly nation, but the honest truth is America is really not a godly nation. And so it takes spirit courage to speak against some of these cultural norms. But uh, here, here at Embrace, we have some values that, that we live by. And, and, and they're in our value system. And honestly, our value system that we have here at Embrace goes against a lot of cultural norms. 
And it takes a spirit of courage to live into these values. Let me, let, let me talk to you about a few of them. Here's our first value. It's Jesus first. We seek to follow Christ in all we do. It takes a spirit of courage uh, to go against the cultural norm of saying, I'm going to put myself first. Is that I'm going to live life the way I want to live. See, I think it takes a spirit of courage to say, hey, I'm going to look and see what Jesus says about this matter, this decision that needs to be made in my life. First and foremost, we look to Jesus. Uh, the second value we have is the power of spirit-led prayer. See, I, get, I think it goes against cult, cultural norm to, to, to pause, to pause and say, hey, I'm going, I'm, I'm going to seek God. I, I'm, going, I'm going to seek God and, and to see, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask Him you know, what we should do. That goes against cultural norm, and it takes a spirit of courage to do that. Here's our third value. It's radical compassion, that we bear each other's burdens. It takes a spirit of courage to, to dive into someone else's life. It takes a spirit of courage to, to go into the depths of a person who may be hurting. See, the cultural norm is like, oh, I'm sorry for them, but that's, that, that's, their, that's their bed. I'm going to let them lie in it. Our fourth um, value is life together, that growth happens in community. So I think it takes a spirit of courage to say uh, that I'm going to live in community. I'm going to let someone else speak into my life. Too often we want to live as individuals, like it's just about me. I'm not worried about anybody else, and I don't need community. Another value we have is our calling to be kingdom-minded. We desire to empower people and develop leaders. Now, now this is one that, that I, I've really been thinking about lately a lot because it takes a spirit of courage to try to build up someone else uh, in a way in which they may actually take our job. It takes a spirit of courage to develop and empower people to be the best they can because often the cultural norm is, man, if I can keep you suppressed, if I can keep you kind of pushed down a little bit, then I have job security or I'm not going to have to worry about it. I'm going to have a leg up on you. You know, the honest truth is, is the kids who are part of Embrace Church, man, I hope and I pray that one day that they take my job. I hope I empower them and I develop them that one day they're just going to come in and they're going to take over Embrace Church and they're going to take it to the next levels that, that really that, that I work my way out of a job. Here's the last value we have here. It's called uh, simplicity in life and ministry. We intentionally create space to encounter God. I think it takes uh, spirit courage, spirit courage to kind of put margins in your life. See, it's easy just to fill up our life. It's, it's easy just to be on the go all the time. But it takes a spirit of courage to be able to say no. I think no is a hard word for us. And it takes a spirit of courage to be able to say no. We've got to make margin in life for God and for family and for community. Well, I want to take this a step further. Those are some of the values of embrace. I want to take this just a step forward. And I kind of want to speak to the American church. See, I'm afraid that uh, there's a cultural norm within the walls of the church that that really aren't healthy. And, and it's going to take a spirit of courage, and it has taken a spirit of courage to live against some of these cultural norms. And here's the one that I want to speak uh, about and speak to today. And I, I, I feel like that we need in the church less aggression and more grace. Less aggression and more grace. I think the cultural norm within the walls of the church now is to be aggressive. But the truth is, the truth is, is uh, throughout history, throughout history, the church has really gotten it wrong many times. Think about this. This is the early church. This is Peter who was called the rock and he's kind of the foundation of the church beginning. Peter had it wrong when he wanted to force uh, cultural norms of the Jewish way of life onto Gentiles. He had it wrong. The church had it wrong uh, when they didn't deny women the right to vote. The church had it wrong in defending slavery, in defending racial inequality, in, in defending segregation over integration. They had it wrong uh, in, in the way we treat, have treated humans. And it's taken, it has taken, it still takes a spirit of courage to stand up against these issues. I believe one of the key issues facing the church today and it still has to do with less aggression and more grace is that within the walls of the church there seems to be uh, we live in a time in which we have uh, we've implemented the the art of labeling like like if you don't agree with me if we don't agree on something then I'm gonna label you 
And we label people less than. We label people as sinners. We label people as, uh, as right wing or left wing. We label people as, 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 as conservative or, or progressive. And many of the issues that we face off against, they're really not moral right or wrongs, but they're preferences. But in the walls of the church, we've been aggressive toward people. And we, we've, we've labeled people, and we've, we've labeled people and given them a character. We've labeled their character. And I think it takes a spirit of courage to pause on that. It takes a spirit of courage to pause and say, instead of me labeling you, instead of us uh, not agreeing with each other and, and labeling you, maybe we need to just uh, pause and have a conversation. See, I think a spirit of courage... Uh, means that you are willing to have holy conversations. That we're willing to have a conversation with each other about what's going on in our lives and in the world of the church. Now, uh, here, here's my last one that, that has to do with uh, a, a more, uh, less aggression and more grace. And it's, it's scripture quoting. I think we live in a time where people within the walls of the church love to quote scripture in a way that uh, that tears down instead of builds up. See, I think Scripture is all about building up people. It's all about leading people to Christ and, 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 and building up the body of Christ. But a lot of times, Scripture is used a way that tears down people. And, and, and the people who may do this, they have the mentality, this is probably their mentality, it's something like this. If the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. That's their mentality. If the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. Well, let me just tell you what that mentality does. It shuts off any conversation we may be willing to have with someone else. And honestly, that's the cowardly way. See, it takes a spirit of courage to say, hey, I'm not too sure we agree with each other, but instead of me just quoting scripture at you, hey, I would love to have a conversation with you. In fact, the person who usually says, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it, is a person who's probably not so secure in their stance, but they don't want to lose control, so they throw those kind of words out. Scripture quoting. It takes a spirit of courage, listen, to say, let's have a holy conversation so that maybe I get to better understand you and you can better understand me. And if we have this conversation, then there's likely that in a spirit of grace, a spirit of courage and a spirit of grace, that man, you know what? The way of Jesus is probably going to come out. And that's the way that's going to win, if you will. Well, let me get back to this passage. And let me give you the good news. <laughs> this, this spirit of courage, the good news is it led Stephen to his death. Well, well actually, that's, that's not good news, is it? But the good news about that is that because there was a spirit of courage in Stephen's life, listen, it opened up the doors for Christianity for the gospel to be spread all over the world. And we're gonna talk about this next week, but at this high council meeting, this young man named Saul was probably present. And we're gonna talk about him uh, next week. But the good news was it opened up the door for the news, the good news of Jesus to be spread all over the world. Can I tell you a spirit of courage? A spirit of courage for us, probably means that we're not going to be stoned to death like Stephen. Stephen was stoned to death. We're probably not going to be stoned to death, but there may be some persecution. There may be some, uh, some, some hurt <laughs> that might come our way. But we have to know and we have to believe that the ways of Jesus are always best. And I believe that the Holy Spirit inspires us to be courageous. So this morning, what I would like to do is I would like for us just to pause. And I'd like for us to pray for a spirit of courage. Because maybe you need a spirit of courage within the walls of your family. Maybe you need them in your workplace. Uh, maybe you need them in your community. And I, I'm going to pray that we would have, or we would implement, or we, we would use that spirit of courage that's available for each and every one of us. Would you pray with me? But we're probably not going to be like Stephen. We're probably not going to be stoned to death, and we thank you for that. But by implementing a spirit of courage, there may be some persecution that comes our way. 
But Lord, may we understand and may we know that you call us to go against cultural norms. Lord, your whole life was about going against the cultural norms of the day. And you've empowered us to do the same. So, Holy Spirit, through your power, would you lead us and guide us and would you empower us with the spirit of courage? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, each week um, at the end of our service, we offer, offer up what we call going deeper questions. And so we'll, uh, we would invite you to maybe watch this with a friend, uh, maybe um, I get together with a group of people and go through these questions together. The dialogue with each other will lead you into a deeper relationship with Jesus. So we invite you to do that. And as always, we are thankful that you watch. If you're ever uh, around Canton, we'd love for you to come uh, worship with us. Uh, we're at 145 West Main Street in downtown Canton, Georgia. We meet on Sunday mornings at 1030. So we we'll hope to see you soon. If not, we'll see you again next week. God bless.